Thank you. Be seated. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read about the parable of the weeds among the wheat. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where do these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to, them, to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then in verse 36 of chapter 13, Jesus explains the parable of the weeds. He said, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. It's the word of God. Well, I was pleased to learn that your church uh, uses the lectionary. Uh, when I have the opportunity to give a message, uh, or I'll, I'll use the lectionary unless the pastor gives me a, a topic to speak about. You know, I'll go check the scriptures out for that day. And if you're not familiar with the lectionary, it's a three-year cycle through the Bible. And there's a year A, B, and C, and this is year A. There are generally four scriptures that are appropriate for the liturgical um, calendar. And another reason that I like to use the lectionary is it forces me to look at scriptures that I ordinarily wouldn't look at or focus on or, or study. And this passage from Mac Matthew chapter 13 is definitely one that I would not have chosen. I don't remember hearing a sermon about the weeds in the field, uh, especially leading to, to judgment at, and the end of the age. And rarely have I don't hear, heard a sermon mentioning the devil. We just don't talk about that much in the Methodist church. But this is our scripture for today. We're going to dig in. Uh, the setting for Matthew chapter 13 is along the Lake of Galilee. Jesus sat in a boat and addressed a large crowd. Um, and then later in the house, or a house, he explained the parables to the disciples and, and some other uh, believers. And it's said that this is the first chapter where Jesus used full parables uh, to teach. He had used graphic analogies earlier in Matthew, and of course, a uh, a, a, a parable is a comparison or an illustration. This is the second of seven parables in this chapter. Well, I have a good study Bible, but I realized that this chapter was over my head. So I had to do some uh, studying. I looked some things up online. I printed off a few uh, articles. Uh, I listened to a couple of sermons on, on, on YouTube and read a book from the library. Uh, Jesus uh, asked why he taught in parables. And, and he, he said to them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And Jesus quoted Isaiah, explaining how the people do not perceive and that their heart has grown dull. Their eyes are shut, they do not hear. He told the disciples that their eyes and ears are blessed and that they see and hear. So for a while I felt like the people on the shore. 
And I kind of felt a little left out on this one. So I, but I realized that we have the Bible to speak to us so that we can, can see and hear. Well, people of Iowa certainly understand good crops. Um, you know, my family moved to Iowa 22 years ago and we couldn't believe how tall the corn was or, or how close the rows were together. And when I was preparing to move, I told some of my coworkers, I said, you know, in Iowa, I think they even grow soybeans under their park benches. But weed control has got to be a real important topic in Iowa. And, and so this is a good parable for our area and, and for the people that Jesus spoke to in, in, in the boat. Jesus said that the weeds were intentionally sown in that field by an enemy. And the indication was they weren't just sprinkled, that the weeds permeated through the whole crop. And the act was done under the cover of darkness. The master had done good work in planting the crop. Proper planting had been done, and everyone was resting asleep from their good labor. It's believed that the um, weed is a zazania, I probably didn't pronounce that right, which is a darnel. That didn't mean anything to me either, but you might understand that. But apparently it looks just like wheat when it's growing. And, and you really can't tell the difference until the head matures, but it's a bad weed. It, it's, ruins a crop and it has poisonous black seeds. And apparently over sowing of, of an, by an enemy was common enough in that era that the, the Roman government had a law against it. So the slaves or servants, as it says in other translations, were quite alarmed. Uh, they had weeds in their master's field and they wanted to know if they should take action. They could tell them apart by then, by the color of the head. But the master told them, let them grow together and at harvest time, they would separate the weeds first, bind them into bundles to be burned, and after that, the wheat would be gathered into his barn. So later in the house, Jesus explained the parables that the field was the world, not just the church, as some people have, have taught. And Jesus was the one that sowed the good seeds, which are the children of the kingdom. The evil one who sowed the weeds is the devil. And the weeds are the children of the evil one. The angels are the reapers. And the harvest is at the end of the age. And all who cause sin and evildoers are going to the furnace of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he ended with let anyone with ears listen. There's no getting around it. This parable deals with judgment. Jesus tells us that we cannot separate all sin and, and sinners and evil from the world. If we try, we'll harm the children of the kingdom in the process. I don't think he's saying not to right wrongs or to evangelize, even if wrongs are in the church or, or to help people. The, full, the scriptures are just full of instructions to do that. But we are simply not the judge and the jury, but God is. Most people, most commentators say that good and evil will coexist in the world through history until Jesus comes again. And most believe that the commingling of good and bad includes the church where the saved and the lost are mixed together. Wow, you could write a book on that subject alone. I'm, I was sweating. I got to talk about this. <laughs> the gathering and the judging at the end of the age is, is an area where a lot of varied in, in, interpretation. Our denomination really does not talk about eschatology very much, and eschatology is the study of, of end things, but end times. But there are four major schools of thought on eschatology and, and disagreements even within those schools. But one would say this is the end of the age where, or this end of the age is when Christ returns and it's the time of the great white throne judgment. Another group says that there's a this, this parable alone disproves the post-millennial view. The present age doesn't fulfill the kingdom promises of Christ. There's another group called dispensationalists. They disagree uh, among themselves. One group says their uh, point is proven because the weeds are taken first, and then the other group says it doesn't matter because when you see the uh, parable of a net later in Matthew 13, the the good fish are taken first. So you can, um, 
enjoy studying that if you'd like. Uh, it's, it'll make your head spin, but um, we want to, what we want to do is, is acknowledge that that's there and maybe and acknowledge that there's a lot of disagreement. As I read the materials and studied this, it, people were talking deep into prophecy and, and fulfillment of the Old Testament. It talks about Jesus discussing hidden things, secrets of the kingdom. Two of the sermons I listened to were about an hour long. <laughs> where, where, you don't, don't panic, don't hit the, and don't get your pillow out. Debbie was already fluffing hers up, but we're, we're not gonna do that. So we're gonna acknowledge that this is very deep. There's a lot of information here and there's a lot to study and, and it is fascinating. But with, with a 15 minute message, we're not, we can't cover that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna devote the rest of our time to talk about the wheat. Who are the wheat? How do we know that we are the good crop or the wheat? Uh, what's different in our life from the life of a weed? What in my life indicates that I'm wheat? So where do we go to find those answers? Well, the place that we have to find those answers is again, the Bible. But as I was looking into this, Christ's words came to me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so that kind of made the my investigation be a little more serious to me. But we, we will go to God's word for, for answers. And there are plenty of plenty of places where God tells us what wheat or what wheat looks like. There are plenty of places where he tells us about weeds too, but we're going to focus on wheat. Our epistle reading today is a good place to start in Romans chapter 8. We'll back up in chapter 8 verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But if you're not of the flesh, you're of the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who are led by the spirit are children of God. Well, clearly the scriptures tell you that you, you must have the Holy Spirit to be a child of God. But this is not only found in Romans, it's found in 1 John. We're going to go back and forth a little bit. Um, 1 John chapter 4 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is from God. By this we know that we abide in him and him in us because he gives us his spirit. We're told that we can have, in this chapter, we're told that we can have boldness on the day of judgment. So now we know if we truly love, we can have the Spirit of God. But it continues, God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Back to John chapter 5 this time. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this that we know that we are children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. John MacArthur, in, a, in his book, Found God's Will, says that if you want to find God's will first, you must be saved, but second, you must be spirit-filled. And he said, the spirit-filled life is yielding every decision to the control of the spirit. And he pointed out that when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he had the same power as, as when he was standing next to Jesus Christ, and he was referring to standing on the water. So the spirit-filled life is, is living in the conscious presence of the indwelling Christ. So how does it express itself? with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart to the Lord, giving thanks always unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll recognize that from Ephesians chapter 5. So returning back to Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that we've received the spirit of adoption 
When we cry, Abba, Father, is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if you remember, Abba is a personal way to address God as a loving father. So with all these um, scriptures that we've read and a little theology thrown in, it's nice to step back and just realize that we can call God Daddy and mean that we love you because you know, we know that you've loved us more than we can ever understand. Suffering, too, is being a part of being joint heirs with Christ. In Romans, it says, in fact, we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified in him. And Paul didn't consider the suffering of this present age worth comparing to the glory to be revealed in us. As he said, we groan inwardly while we await adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Even the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Paul said, in hope we were saved, and hope that is seen is not hope. So we're to wait in patience. Peter spoke about suffering and patience in 1 Peter. Although you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with indescribable and glorious joy. For you're receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Well, I, my head was kind of spinning. Yours may be too. From all the, uh, that was kind of a scripture drill. But it, it gave me peace knowing that a lot in the Bible deals with, uh, with this subject. And, and from Paul and John and Peter, and that helps us know what makes us wheat. Or the sheep that Jesus spoke about so often. Jesus said that he's the good shepherd. He said he knows his own, his own knows him. You could write a bunch of books on this. This is a very heavy topic that we have today. But if, if we take a deep breath and just say, let's just kind of review what the word says about being Jesus wheat and a child of God. What do we do to be wheat? We have the Holy Spirit in us. We're, we need to be led by that spirit. We should abide in him. We should confess that Jesus is the Son of God and repent and be baptized. We need to love God and obey his commandments. We give him praise and, and, and we're thankful. And we cry, Abba, Father, knowing God is a loving parent. And yes, we're going to have to suffer with Christ. And we need to have patience. We've got to believe in him. But we can rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. And God sends the, the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Blessings and suffer, suffering are shared by weeds and wheat. We're not the reapers. Our job is to go to Jesus. We can find him by kneeling at the foot of the cross. That's where we receive the right to become children of God. He paid the price. Otherwise, we would not be able to shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And, and we need to witness to everybody weeds and wheat. Because remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Let everyone with ears listen. Now we can pray with the psalmist. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me to the way everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Carl. know you would probably agree that was a great message and I was a bit remiss I did not introduce him at the beginning of the service now you know Carl and his lovely wife Debbie and he was explaining to me that uh, when he was in college he went to the College of Alabama in the great state of Alabama and Debbie w went to Auburn Le Leslie who was here last week 
Oh, yeah. Your, okay, your speaker thought, last week said she was going to talk about me, so I okay. hope she didn't. <laughs> Never mind that. What I was going for yeah. was that, yeah, I kind of understand the rivalry. You know, we you got bet. Iowa and Iowa State, and everybody knows who's better there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyways, uh, thank you again, Carl, for bringing that thank inspiring you, message to us. Uh, and. That helps us to know that Jesus spoke in parables to better help his disciples understand what it, he was trying to make clear to them. And it helps make things clear to us too. So now we will uh, respond to the word and we'll go to our call to prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. It's at this time that we bring before God our joys and concerns, and the ushers are grabbing microphones right now, so if you have joy or concern, would you please come forward, and if you don't feel comfortable with that, they will meet you where you are. Danny called me, and... Uh, Butch has had some health concerns, and his birthday is July 30th. And so anybody that would like to send him a birthday card, I think he'd really appreciate it. And say a prayer. He's had some problems. Thank you. Are there any more? There's one. We have a joy. Um, Mom always says that when people ask her how old she is, she'll say, well, let you figure it out. I was 50 years old when man walked on the moon. Holy cow. So she's celebrating her 95th birthday today. Wow, amen. <laughs> Any more? There's one. Um, on Tuesday, we'll mark uh, five months since I married my beautiful wife, Jody, And uh, so that'll be a good happy day for us. Thank you. Excellent. Everyone congratulate them. <laughs> Anybody? have anything weighing heavily on their heart, any concerns? I was not provided any information on hospitalizations or sickness. Uh, if there are any, let me know. Okay, we'll uh, bow in silent prayer. Rita, thank you. Um, we bring these before you, O oh Lord. Amazing God of love, so right and so pure, grace us with your presence. We desire to lean on you even more today than we have in the past. May we manifest a hope right and pure in honesty. You know our hearts, Lord. 
We ask for faith and trust enough to strengthen the hearts you know all so well. Our hope is built on nothing less. Amen. And as our uh, Savior and Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to say, our Father, who art in heaven, going to our call to offering. Uh, let us be mindful that everything we own, everything we think we possess is not ours. Hold it loosely in your hand. Be ready to remember that everything you have is the Lord's. We are merely stewards. Let us be uh, sharing and, and knowing that we give it all back to you, Lord. Accept these gifts from our hands and overflow from our hearts. Allow us to make room for the love that will ultimately find us, becoming the people you envision us to be in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us rise and praise God. 